The strong Markov property and consequences like the reflection principle for Brownian motion are very powerful tools, especially for doing exact computations of distributions of various statistics associated to the process. Right now, let's consider the running maximum of Brownian motion. That is, the new process, Bt max, which is the maximum over s less than or equal to t of Bs. For example, if this is a Brownian path over here, then the running maximum looks like this. As you can see, its path properties are quite different from Brownian motion. It will have long horizontal stretches, and of course it is non-decreasing, which means, in fact, it is differentiable almost everywhere. So it looks quite different from Brownian motion. However, as we'll see, its distribution at each time is closely related to Brownian motion. Let's also recall that in our studies of discrete time martingales and submartingales, we proved a number of useful estimates about the running maximum of the absolute value of a process, which we called the star version of the process. So that would be b absolute value t max. That's not quite the same as what we have here, since of course the Brownian motion, for example, has larger absolute value at this point than its value above zero. But we will be able to turn information about this process into bounds for this process, as we'll see a little bit later. Here is the key result that I want to show right now, which is sometimes called Bachelier's principle, after Bachelier who proved it, which is the statement that this process here, the running maximum of Brownian motion, at each time, its distribution is the same as the absolute value of Brownian motion which is a very surprising result given how different their path properties are. And in fact, we're even going to compute essentially the joint distribution of the running maximum together with Brownian motion. That is, we're going to show the following. For any appropriate real numbers z and y, we will compute the probability that the running maximum of bt is bigger than or equal to z, while bt is less than z minus y. For example, we could have this comparison here, where this height here is y. And we will show that that is equal to just the probability that bt is bigger than z plus y exactly. While this is true in any starting state, we're going to do it in the case of starting at 0, in which case the z and y for which this will hold is where they are greater than or equal to 0. Notice that this is a probability just for the single random variable bt. In other words, we could write this as the probability that some standard normal random variable is bigger than z plus y over the square root of t, which is something we can explicitly calculate as an integral anyway. Now, before we delve in just one more time, let me emphasize that as processes, these are radically different. This one is non-decreasing and therefore differentiable almost everywhere. This one, the absolute value of Brownian motion, is an example of something called a Bessel process. And it is at least as rough as Brownian motion is. So while the endpoints of these two processes, their distribution at a fixed time t, are equal, we will see that their joint distributions are, of course, not the same. To prove this, we're going to use the reflection principle applied with the hitting time of the height z. Indeed, the singleton set z is a closed set, and the Brownian motion has continuous paths, and therefore, as we've proved, this tau is an optional time for the Brownian motion filtration. That means from the reflection principle that we can reflect vertically at this time, and still have a Brownian motion. So let's take b tilde t to be that new Brownian motion right here. Here's the picture. We let the Brownian motion flow until it reaches height z, and then at that point we reflect it vertically. So the path in red afterward is bt tilde, and the black path is the continuation of bt.
Now, let's consider the event that this hitting time tau is less than or equal to t. What does that mean? That means exactly that the Brownian motion hits height z by time t. In other words, this is exactly the event that the running maximum of Brownian motion up to time t is at least z. Now, on that event, meaning that we are past this reflection point, the event that the Brownian motion at some time t later is below this line, is less than z minus y, just doing the reflection, is exactly the same as the event that the reflected Brownian motion, bt tilde, is bigger than z plus y right here. So therefore, what we've shown is that the event that the running maximum of Brownian motion is bigger than or equal to z, while bt itself is less than z minus y, is the same as the event that tau is less than or equal to t, and that the reflected Brownian motion, bt tilde, is bigger than z plus y. Now, up to time tau, the Brownian motion and the reflected Brownian motion are the same by definition. Therefore, if we define tau tilde to be the first hitting time of the reflected Brownian motion at height z, well, that's just going to be the same because these two processes agree before they hit time z. So that is also equal to tau, which means that we can write this event alternatively in terms of the process b tilde entirely. This is the event that tau tilde is less than or equal to t and bt tilde is bigger than z plus y. But notice that if bt tilde is bigger than z plus y, then it's bigger than or equal to z. And since the paths are continuous, that means that it must have hit time z at some earlier time, which is exactly to say that on this event, tau tilde is less than or equal to t. And so this event here is actually just the event that bt tilde is bigger than z plus y. So from the reflection principle, we have that these two events are equal, and so there too are their probabilities equal. And that shows the joint distribution statement that I claimed. Now from there, we can derive Bachelier's principle, that is that the running maximum has the same distribution at the endpoint as the absolute value, as follows. If we look at the probability that the maximum is greater than or equal to z, we can divide that into that event intersected with the event that the Brownian motion is bigger than or equal to z, or that the Brownian motion is less than z at that time. Of course, if the Brownian motion is bigger than z at time t, then the running maximum is as well. In other words, this event is contained in this event, which means that the intersection of those two events is just the smaller one. So this first term here is just the probability that bt is greater than or equal to z, which we can equally write as the probability bt is strictly greater than z, since the Brownian motion has no point mass at any point. And as for this second term here, that's what we just proved is equal to the probability that bt is greater than z plus y, where in this case, y is equal to zero. And so these two terms here are the same as each other, which says that this probability is equal to twice the probability that bt is greater than z. But that's, of course, by the symmetry of Brownian motion, the same as the probability that bt is greater than z or bt is less than minus z, which is the probability that the absolute value of bt is greater than z. And that proves our result. By the way, if we wanted some information about the running maximum of the absolute value from there, we can do a simple estimate. The probability that bt star is bigger than or equal to z, well, that's less than or equal to the probability that 
the maximum of just the positive part is bigger than or equal to z plus the probability that the maximum of the negative is greater than or equal to z. But now applying this result and using that symmetry, we'll get that this is 4 times the probability that the absolute value of bt is greater than or equal to z. And that's just a certain Gaussian integral, which we can estimate using calculus to be less than or equal to 2 times this exponential. So while we don't have an exact answer for the running maximum, we do have a nice Gaussian tail bound for it. And this turns out to be stronger than any of those LP bounds that we have from submartingale methods. There's a nice visceral demonstration of the power of the reflection principle. And actually, let's record a result that we had from the middle of the proof there, which is of its own independent interest. That is, if we look at the hitting time, TZ, of the singleton point Z, the first time that height Z is achieved when the Brownian motion starts at time zero, we saw that that is the same thing as the event that the running maximum is greater than or equal to Z. And so from what we just proved, we see that that is equal to twice the probability that the Brownian motion is bigger than Z. This statement here is sometimes by itself referred to as the reflection principle. In fact, in many textbooks, they will say reflection principle, this statement here, and then give a heuristic argument for why this is true, employing the actual geometric reflection principle that we proved, but state that that exact statement is actually too difficult to prove on its own, and so give a strong Markov property proof directly of this statement. We went all the way, which isn't that hard, and proved the more visual reflection principle holds true literally, and see this is a computational consequence of it. Of course, it tells us more than that. It means we have an exact formula here. This is, of course, two times the integral from z up to infinity of 1 over root 2 pi t e to the minus x squared over 2t dx. So we have an exact integral formula for this, which, by the way, is exactly the cumulative distribution function of this random variable. That is, we have an explicit expression for the full law of this hitting time for any height, z. Now, it's written in a funny way right now. as an integral from z up to infinity with this t embedded in two places. We'd much rather have it as an integral from 0 up to t of some function. That would give us a probability density. And we can do that using a little bit of calculus. If we substitute x is equal to z times the square root of t over u, u is our new integration variable, then you can check that when x is equal to z, the lower limit here, that means that u is equal to t. And when x is equal to infinity, that sends u to 0. So this is twice the integral from t up to 0 of 1 over root 2 pi t e to the minus z squared over 2u there. And then when we substitute the differential, we get z times root t times minus 1 half u to the minus 3 halves du. And now we see some magic. The root t here and the root t here cancel, so we don't have that inside. And when we finish doing all of these cancellations, we get the following formula. And we see that we actually have a density for the hitting time here. Here it is explicitly. The probability density of the hitting time for Brownian motion in one dimension of any height z, where z is positive in this example, is this function right here. Here is a graph of this function in the case z is equal to 1. Now, what does it look like for other z's? Well, by inspection of this formula, we see that if alpha is greater than 0, if I scale z by root alpha and t by alpha, 
which is the reverse of the usual diffusion scaling because we're taking a hitting time, which sort of reverses from the process, the role of space and time, that that's equal to one over alpha rho tz of t. So therefore, it's good enough to understand what happens to this in the case where z is equal to one, because that tells us that the density rho of t root alpha, so for any height root alpha at s, where s is substituted for alpha t here, is equal to one over alpha of rho t1 at s over alpha. So in other words, this picture is the same for all heights. We just have to spread it out by a factor of alpha and shrink it by one over alpha, rescaling space and time in order to get the density of t root alpha. Now, what can we derive from this? Well, for starters, we see that this is a probability density. You can check that this integrates to one. And so that tells you that the probability that tz is finite is one for any z. Actually, we've only done this, I guess, for positive z, but of course, the hitting time of minus z for our Brownian motion is the same as the hitting time of z for the negative of the Brownian motion, but that is the same as the hitting time for the original Brownian motion, in distribution anyway, since these two are both Brownian motions. Now I should comment that we actually already knew this because we showed that the limb soup as t goes to infinity of both plus or minus bt, since minus bt is also a Brownian motion, is infinity. In fact, you can divide this by t to the alpha for any alpha less than one half and still get that that's infinite, almost surely, which tells us that we must exceed any height eventually. And since the paths are continuous, that means we must reach any height eventually with probability one. But something we couldn't tell before, and we can from this explicit density for the hitting time, is that the expected value of the hitting time of any non-zero height is infinite because this expected value can be computed as this integral of the density against the function t. But we can now calculate that. The t just turns this one over root t cubed to a one over root t. And then we have this Gaussian density, but it's only Gaussian in this constant variable z. It's an e to the constant over t in the integration variable t. And you can easily check that that function is bounded in the unit interval and that it tends to one as t tends to infinity. So what that means is that this integral is asymptotically the same as just the integral of one over root t. But of course, over the whole positive real line, that's infinite. So what we've shown here is that one dimensional Brownian motion is null recurrent. Just like simple random walk on the integer lattice. It will hit every height almost surely, but the expected time it takes to do so for any height other than the starting point is always infinite. Now, before we sign off on this, let's note that we can use this to give exact calculations of some other interesting times associated to statistics of the process. For example, we've seen that the Brownian motion keeps returning to zero infinitely often as we go off to infinity. But what if we stop at a particular time, let's say at time one, and ask where does the last zero before time one occur? Now, this is not a stopping time. In order to check if this is less than or equal to t, it's not good enough to know what happens to the path only up to time t. You need to know what happens to the path up until time one for any t. Nevertheless, we can use the information that we just gathered to compute the exact distribution of this random variable L. In fact, it's arc sine distributed. That is to say, its cumulative distribution function is this arc sine function right here. One way to say that is to say that this last hitting time of zero before one has the same distribution as the sine squared of a random variable u, where that random variable u is uniformly distributed on the interval from zero up to two pi. 
Alternatively, we can just differentiate this and write the statement that the density of this last hitting time L1 has the explicit form of this, which I've drawn the graph of right here. It's symmetric about r equals 1 half, and it is concentrated near 0 and 1. That is to say, it is likely that the last 0 is shortly after you leave 0, but if it doesn't happen there, it's equally likely that it's really close to 1 at the end. It is least likely to be in the middle of the interval. And once again, we can also see what happens for other intervals, not the interval from 0 to 1, but the interval from 0 up to alpha, just by doing another scaling argument. Here we can use this scaling of Brownian motion, which is also a Brownian motion. So if we consider the last 0 of this Brownian motion on the interval from 0 up to alpha, well, because this is a Brownian motion, that will have the same distribution as the last 0 of the Brownian motion we started with on the interval from 0 up to alpha. But at the same time, by definition, this is the supremum over all t less than or equal to alpha with the condition that bt alpha is equal to 0. But bt alpha being 0 is the same as b alpha t being 0. And now from that scaling there, you can check that that's the same thing as alpha times the supremum over s less than or equal to 1, for which bs is equal to 0. In other words, this is alpha times L1 of b. And so in order to get the same distribution on the interval from 0 up to alpha instead of 0 up to 1, you just have to stretch this to that wider interval. Now the proof of this comes from a connection between L1, the last zero, and T0, the first zero. Of course, if we start the Brownian motion at zero, we know where the first zero will be. Rather, we have to look at the Brownian motion starting at an arbitrary point x and look at the first time it reaches zero. Then we have the following convolution formula that this probability can be computed by integrating the probability starting in x that the first hitting time of zero is bigger than one minus t against the law of the Brownian motion at time t starting in zero. Proving this convolution formula is on your homework. Now notice we have a nice symmetry that if we start the Brownian motion at x and let it flow until it hits time zero, by taking the negative of the process and shifting everything by subtracting x, this is the same as the probability starting at zero, that the hitting time of x is bigger than one minus t. And we have an exact formula for this probability here. It's given by this density that we computed on the last couple of slides. And so we can now work out this integral exactly. I could spend two slides going through all of the integration by parts and Fubini's theorem applications, but it's basically just calculus. And if you're very interested, I suggest that you try to work it out for yourself, that when you do this Fubini's theorem application here, you get that this is equal to 1 over pi, reversing the integration, we get integral from 1 minus t up to infinity of the square root of t over the square root of u times t plus u du. And now if we make the substitution r is equal to t over u plus t, that turns into 1 over pi, the integral from 0 up to t, of dr over the square root of r times 1 minus r, which exactly shows that this is the density in question. There's really no end to the fun we can have doing exact calculations using the reflection principle and these associated tools. So I'm just going to list a few more fun facts We've seen now that the last zero of Brownian motion in the unit interval is arc sine distributed. We could also ask, at what time does Brownian motion achieve its maximum on a given interval? That is, 
Let's look at B1 max, a random variable which by itself, as we saw at the beginning of this lecture, is distributed the same as the absolute value of B1, the absolute value of a standard normal random variable. But at what time does the Brownian motion achieve its maximum on that interval? At what earliest time does it? Well, that random variable is also arc sine distributed. And we can also look at the following random set. Look at the set of all times in the unit interval where the Brownian motion is strictly positive. And we can take its Lebesgue measure. Its Lebesgue measure will be a random variable. And that random variable is also arc sine distributed. I'm not going to go through proofs of these fun facts. I'm going to whet your appetite with them. If you would like to see some proofs of them that involve both ideas from continuous time processes like the reflection principle and limit results using Donsker's invariance principle and some fun calculations involving random walks, I refer you to Olaf Kallenberg's excellent book. These results are in theorem 13.16. We've now seen that the strong Markov property of Brownian motion is a very powerful tool for showing us qualitative and quantitative properties of the Brownian paths, at least in one dimension. Next, in our final lecture of the course, we will see how the strong Markov property also gives us powerful quantitative and qualitative tools for understanding Brownian motion in higher dimensions, and in so doing, establish a strong connection between probability theory and harmonic analysis.